Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you would take your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.18. We're going to bring a message on being ambassadors. For my um, witnessing to people and giving the gospel out, come to find out that I think a lot of Christians have been very poor ambassadors. Now, I've had my time that I didn't witness in the right and good spirit. Um, some of it was my fault. Some of it was not being instructed properly. And then, of course, there's always two sides of the coin. There's a lot of people that have heard the gospel, rejected the gospel. They're uh, bitter against God, and that's their fault. They're just using a, a witness for an escape uh, excuse to damn their soul and go to hell. And I feel sorry for them for doing that, but um, let's learn a few things about being an ambassador. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be a reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians, and we thank you for your goodness and your blessings and your truths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now as we look at the scriptures and we pay attention to it, every saved, born-again Christian, we have the ministry of reconciliation. So that's what soul winning is all about. It's not about getting uh, scalps on your uh, belt and... Uh, and impressing your friends with how many converts you have. That's what the uh, Pharisees did. We have a ministry of reconciliation. I'm talking with one individual. That individual was a Unitarian. That individual was very animostic towards, say, born-again Bible-believing Christians. And that individual, now this I don't think would have been self-generated by the individual, but they must have received this uh, scalp-type mentality because they felt or said, and I'm trying to remember the exact words, is like, oh yeah, they just wanted to get uh, a Unitarian converted so that they'd have, um, in other words, they were, they felt like the whole purpose of the Christian trying to win them was to score a scalp. And that's not the ministry of reconciliation. You need to see people as souls and souls that need a savior and people in need. It's not about our ego to uh, prove how great we are to God. It's about their need of redemption and their need, and, and you need to look at their souls and see them as souls, not as scalps. Now then, we are ambassadors. The other thing, I don't think a lot of Christians are good ambassadors. Webster's defines an ambassador for us. A minister of the highest rank, employed by one prince or state at the court of another, to manage the public concerns of his own prince or state in representing the power and dignity of his sovereign. Notice that, representing the power and dignity of his sovereign. So if you're a Christian, you should represent the Lord the best manner you could. Now, I just had a friend of mine uh, in watching some of the messages and noted that I had uh, dressed well with nice shirts, different colors of the shirts. And I told him, I said, well, that's because I'm an ambassador and I want to give a good appearance. Now, I can get um, dowdy. Uh, I, can, I can get out on the um, swamp six o'clock in the morning, sun coming up, on shade, dirty old hunting clothes, smell the beautiful aroma of uh, the gases coming out of the swamp, and I can go out and work in the dirt with uh, scraggly old clothes and uh, get back to nature, but when I'm representing the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to put on my best. When I'm going out on visitation and witnessing, I want to dress and look like an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. I highly encourage you to do that. You don't have to always get a suit on. 
but you can just put on some nice, clean, neat, good-looking clothes. Uh, you can be casual, but you can be casual, and um, you can be clean, and you can be wholesome-looking. I recommend that. If you ever take a look at ambassadors, whenever they go to court, they always dress their best because they represent their government. You and I are arguing for the prerogatives of Christ, our Savior and Lord. And we're representing the highest government in the universe, far above principalities of men. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ, so God, we beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And again, I want to emphasize, it's not necessary to always be in a suit. Uh, I think uh, today when you go out door to door visitation, I don't know, you can argue it both ways. We tried it suit and tie. I go out a lot of times in suit and tie, and sometimes people are so um, dowdy in their dress that that uh, makes them uncomfortable. So maybe it ought to be a nice uh, sports shirt and, and some nice dress pants, and but you ought to look good and uh, you know pray about it and see what gives you the most open doors and, and the best. But you ought to put on your best and look good for the Lord. For you have made him, and you need to, to realize, and we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. That would imply that we need to start praying heavily and big time. And again, we know here in our little church, we're praying for the Lord to add a couple families, solid soul winning families, to give us a base to reach our community. And so we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. And that's what we should be praying, that God will give us the opportunity to witness to people in our jobs, in our, in our public service, and that we'll be able to bring people to the Lord. I plan on going back to public service that I was in before, volunteer basis, and I was inviting people, and people are starting to come to church. And I plan to go back to that in another month or two. And wherever you're serving, you you know, represent the Lord. We've got DVDs and tracts. Hand them out. Invite people to church. Now, a pure heart is required to be in the presence of the Holy God. What does God require of us as ambassadors? To have a pure heart and a perfect heart. Now, the Bible teaches 24 states of the heart. 12 are positive and good, and 12 are negative. Two of the heart states that are required to be a good ambassador are to have a pure heart and a perfect heart. Now, a pure heart is required to be in the presence of a holy God. Look at here. You need God in your ministry, except the Lord build the house. They that labor, labor in vain. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He should receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Only by knowing God will we be able to understand life as the Lord sees it. And that's what we want to bring to lost men and lost women, to see life in God's truth as God sees it. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. The purpose of soul winning is not lust but sacrificial so the charity is to see people as lost souls perishing in great need of Christ out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith on things from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jaggedness now if you do it in the right spirit walking in the spirit nothing will impress people more than your solid, sold-out faith in God's word and God's ways. That sometimes offends them, but usually the Holy Spirit will overcome that for you if you do it in a humble, contrite spirit of truth and boldness in Christ, a godly boldness. The hindrance to a pure heart is a double heart, which God condemns. As I told you, there's 12 positive states of the heart, 12 negative. And so a double heart, understanding that, helps you understand what a pure heart is. And the psalmist wrote it this way. They speak vanity, empty, every one with his neighbor. 
with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. And so in Christianity today, there's a great falling away. The Lord is cutting people off because they're not representing him in a godly, holy, righteous, truthful fashion. You've got all kinds of heresies in the body of Christ professing Christianity, and we'll call Christianism. And there are um, all kinds of hypocrisies. I happen to, I won't, I won't mention it, but I happened to be uh, yesterday in another church. And it's amazing the moral depravity in that church that professes to be Christian but is accepting the wickedness and ways of the world. I'm not going to elaborate on that any further because I don't want to start a war. I want to win folks. That church that they're attending is going to send them straight to hell. It's not preaching or teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The great importance of a pure heart is that through it we are able to grasp and express genuine love to God and others with a more perfect understanding of God's word and God's truth. Now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith on fame. The biblical definition of the word pure means pure as being cleansed, to purify, to cleanse, to make free from admixture, Purity is measured by the percentage of the substance that matches the standard. Get that? And what Christians don't have anymore is godly standards. Being free from foreign elements, what you have is a massive influx of the world into the church in order to get people. One of the things that caused our church fallout, and there's many other factors, I'm not just picking on this one, is a desire to bring worldly music into the church to excite the saints and to draw lost people. Well, if you draw, draw lost people with the world, you're drawn them to the world. Now, with that, the baby immature Christians that aren't willing to sacrifice, they come up with, well, I got liberty. I, I can listen to worldly music if I want to. You're absolutely right. You have liberty and you can't. But I am not going to disgrace grace for your liberty and allow worldly music into the church. And that's my responsibility as a pastor. It's not yours. And if you want to listen to the Beatles in your home, that's your liberty. But I recommend if you want to overcome carnality that you listen to godly music rather than worldly music you might be saying, help, I need somebody. And I think a lot of people are there. Thus a pure heart is one that seeks God with double-mindedness or the distractions of other affections. That is, with the whole heart, God's love is pure toward us, pure and is confirmed by the fact that he loves us when we often hate him. And don't tell me we don't hate him. The minute that we want to blame God for rain in our parade, when one of his thou shall nots comes up and we want to sin. Now, I was also yesterday asked a question. And I can't give you the details of this, but basically the question was, is this sin? And of course, everybody wanted an okay that this was okay to do, this is okay to sin. I said, it's sin. There's it just no way you cannot make it be sin. Now, I was limited, and I said, I cannot tell you that this sin, the repercussions may be minor. But with any sin, the repercussions could still be major. So little sins are still sin. Now, if you want to I not recommend this. If you want to take the chance that the repercussions won't be major. Well, I'll give you an example. And I'll give you a good example. And I'll give you a biblical example. And here's a good one that's impartial. Let's take drinking alcoholic beverages. I haven't drank in 40 some years. And the Bible says it's not for kings to drink, old Emmanuel. I'm a child of the king. I'm an ambassador.
capacity. I do not want to take the chance of becoming intoxicated and forgetting God's law and committing gross or worse sin. So I've chosen in my liberty, in my free will, to sanctify myself and not ingest drugs or intoxicating beverages. Now, other people it's like, well, what's wrong with one drink? I just drink one drink. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. One drink probably will not bring strong ramifications. But there's a saying. Man take drink, drink take man. And the minute that you take the first drink, you're in the danger of having the drink take you. You can become an alcoholic. You can become intoxicated. You can get tickets for Dead Rock. You can end up in a world of pain and hurt and regret and sorrow. The minute you take the first drink, I can't. I don't drink. I won't drink. I shall not drink. And I shall not suffer the sorrows of the world. I will not. It's impossible for me to get a DWI. It's impossible for me to uh, get intoxicated and get in a car accident. It's impossible for me to get into all or any of the harm that comes from the indulgence of booze. And if you want to be wise and avoid the sorrows and the pains of the world, don't drink. You don't need it. It's no good for you. And it doesn't taste that good anyways. And after all, what you're drinking is urine. You're drinking little bitty creatures' urine. They gobble up the yeast, and then they, <coughs> or if you want to call it defecation, that's what you're drinking when you drink booze. I don't do urine. Have a nice day. God bless. The purpose of a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, because Christians have such an admixture, and I've preached on this this morning, I've taught this this morning. Most of the Christians I see today are almost completely blinded to God. They don't know him. They don't know what he wants of them. They are estranged. Yes, they're forgiven. Yes, they're saved. But their hearts are not pure. They cannot see God. They cannot see things from God's point of view. They only see things from a carnal, lustful, worldly point of view. God requires a pure heart within those who come into his presence. Who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. A pure heart is required to call upon the Lord. And this is a scripture verse we expounded not too long ago. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood, earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. So, you want to be a drinking, you want to be forgiven and drink? Yeah, you can drink alcohol and be forgiven, but you're probably going to be a vessel to dishonor. And you're probably going to hurt yourself, and you're probably going to end up with all types of ramifications sooner or later. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and repairing unto every good work. Now, another illustration of our current time is the STDs. As I said this morning, I was in a discussion with a psychotherapist. And, of course, the psychotherapist is supposedly uh, people go to the psychotherapist to um, get their approvals for... Um, transgender operations and stuff like that. And I was telling the psychotherapist it's confusion and it's sin, and then they're saying to me, no, they're born that way, and it's, I don't buy it. And we were in a debate, and, um, well, we live in a confused world. If any man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I just happen to know I'm a man not a woman. I'm not confused. And I think if people were truthful and honest, they wouldn't get confused. I think because 
they get into sin. And one of the things that they admitted was almost all these people are heavy drug users. You know, drugs mess up your mind. Maybe they ought to get rid of the booze and the drugs and the tortured life, and maybe they would be satisfied to be a woman or a man. You know, like it's really okay if you're born a woman to be a woman, and it's really okay if you're born a man to be a man. Now, that's one of the things that I tell people, because today a lot of men do not know how to act and act toward the opposite sex. I preach very heavily on husbands loving their wives and how husbands are to treat and take care of their wives. People saw me take care of my wife through very arduous situations for five years. It cannot be denied. I took care of her in a godly, righteous manner and fashion. That's self-evident. And I recommend it. But I am not about to become a woman. And you got this crazy thing that, well, you gotta get you gotta get in touch with your effeminate side. And this will offend you. I don't have an effeminate found an effeminate side in me, I'd kill it. Because I want to be a gentleman. I can be a sensitive man. I can be a caring man. I am to be kind and loving in all that I do as a man. But I'm not to give my strength to women. And women should be girly. It's okay for a woman to be a girly girl. It's not okay for a man to be a girly man. It isn't going to help you in your life. We're looking for men to be strong, not to give their strength to women, but to be kind and affectionate, to be gentlemen. David said, thy gentleness has made me great. But we live in a very confused world today, so we're telling you these things so that you'd understand that you need to mature in the Lord and, and be able to take the gospel out in a godly spirit. Now, get out there and start witnessing. Don't wait till you arrive, because you're never going to arrive. But as you start witnessing, the more you grow in the Lord, the more you'll find you'll be more effective. If a man therefore purge himself, that, that Unitarian that I witnessed to told me that they had gotten up and walked out on a couple born-again Christians like myself. They didn't get up and walk out on me because I treat them with respect. And I wasn't abusive in demanding and giving the gospel. And when I convinced them that all I wanted to do was give them the truth, they allowed me to do it. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of pure heart. A pure heart is required to call on the Lord. And so you want you want your prayers answered? You know, we get message. Why are the heavens brass? Why isn't God hearing our prayers? Chances are your heart is a mixture of worldly things, and it takes a pure heart to call on the Lord. The ultimate purpose of a pure heart is to be able to serve God and to love others without any admixture of good or evil motives which is most needful for those who would be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. In other words, you want to just have a good motive of caring for hurting, lost, suffering people that are on the road to hell and damnation, and God doesn't want them to go to the pit or to the fire. God's willing that none should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. ultimate pur purpose of a pure heart is to be able to serve God and love others. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And of course today the love of many is wax cold and uh, covetousness is the central sin to that. Desiring something to obtain and not willing to wait on the Lord and obtain it in time judgment and righteousness. So we're to seek God with, a, 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 with the whole heart. A divided heart will grieve the Holy Spirit and quench his power in cleansing the mind, will, and emotions. 
I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. The obvious secret is hiding the word in the heart. If you want to grow and mature in the Lord, you have to read your Bible. You have to hide the word in your heart. That's what God will use when your mind and soul are under duress. The words of God will come to the forefront and guide you. There's no way to avoid not reading your Bible. You have to read it. Blessedness comes from being wholehearted with the Lord. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. Now another individual I was talking with suffered a lot in life. They, were, they had uh, riches and wealth and they own words have been humbled there. They're struggling, and they're hurt, and they're bitter over it, and they had things taken away from them. And so their question is, well, why do the righteous suffer? I mean, I was trying to do everything right. I thought I was doing everything right. Why did this come upon me? I said, you need to read the book of Job. It answers the question, why do the righteous suffer? Now, I know why this individual was going through what they were going through, and it was because God was trying to open up their eyes. They are filled with they were filled with self-righteousness. And they needed to be humble. And so Satan, Satan is always waiting to test people. He just loves to do that. That's what happened with Job. Skin for skin, Satan said. Yeah, all the man hath will give for his life. And the Lord said, Well, hey, you're making me move against him. I'm going to give you that opportunity to test him and prove him. But there was no reason to do this. There's no cause. He was, he was living a good life. And the devil said, ah, skin for skin. And so the devil, Lord said, okay, you can have him. Uh, you, can, you can test him, but you can't, you can't take his life. And Job suffered. And then when Job finally saw God, when his heart became pure, and he saw God, he said, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. Job came to saving knowledge because his repentance was of a godly sort. He was going from the air of his own self-righteousness to the revelation and truth of God's person. When he saw God, he was broken and humbled. And that's what that individual, I hope they reach the point of salvation when they fall on their knees before God, repent of their sins, and repent of their error and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. The joy of life comes to those who live their lives unto God in a normal way, separating themselves from sin. It is not to live an austere life as an Amish paradise. An austere life doesn't prove anything. And, of course, there's been revelations now, some to slander, but they're starting to see that these folks living in these Amish paradises live lives of um, deep sin. No, it's not living in Amish paradise, but a sold-out commitment and disciplined life under biblical principles lived unto the Lord Jesus Christ out of love. Not out of the arduousness of law, but out of the spirit of love. A love for Christ, a love for your Savior, a love for the God that saved you. As the Father hath loved me. See, here we go. Oh, oh blessed. I didn't get to this. Uh, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies that seek him with the whole heart. That's what God wants you to do. They also do no iniquity. <clears throat> they walk in his ways. So if your heart is after God and it's a pure heart, it'll, your heart will take you away from sin rather than towards sin. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. And the psalmist goes on and says, Give me an understanding that I shall keep thy law, yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Now, <clears throat> the basic carnal understanding of God's law is that its restrictions are on their fun and their pleasure and their joy. And that's why they reject God. When 
the truth of the matter is, God's law is to keep them from hurting themselves and others and bringing destruction and misery into their lives. I just gave you the illustration with alcohol. And but people are just, oh, I gotta have a drink, I gotta have a drink. Like, really? Gee, you're off this week, aren't you? I haven't had to have a drink in over 40 years. And I'm happier than you are. I got more joy than you have. I've just been through two excessively excruciating trials, and I got more joy than you've got with all your business. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in, in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, O oh, beautiful for situation, the joy of the holy is Mount Zion, the side to the north, the city of the great king. Oh, there's something mighty sweet about the Lord. Oh, there's something mighty sweet about the Lord. It doesn't really matter what the people say. I've got a lot more joy than you've got with all your booze. You need that booze to sustain the pain of your soul. I've got the spirit of Christ in me that takes away the pain of my soul. Give me understanding. He said, take my yoke, for I am lowly and meek, and learn of me, and you shall find rest for your souls. The joy of life comes to those who live their lives unto God in a normal way. Look at here. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. In general, the most difficult issue of life that the faithful Christian will face in their life is the slander that will be placed against you for your unwillingness not to run and to riot with lost people. Now, the truth of the matter is, lost people are very vindictive. And when you make them feel uncomfortable with your righteousness, they like to bring you down. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil. So, as I use, the, we use the booze all night tonight. So as I go out and I witness and I testify to people and um, um, people find out you don't drink and they're like, well, what's wrong with you? There's got to be something wrong with you. I drink. And if you don't drink, that means either something wrong with me or something wrong with you because we're not doing the same thing. And it ain't going to be me. It's got to be you. That's what goes on in their psyche. I told you I was speaking with a uh, psychotherapist. Well, my Bible gives me more insight to people's problems than psychotherapy. Say, why is that? All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And if you know the scriptures and you know the word and you read the stories in the Bible, then you'll see the higher space. The world and self-conceited brethren that need to have everything hammered on their own anvil can easily be burdensome. And I, I spoke to you that today, and just I'm not going to go over it all again tonight. The brethren uh, find great joy in giving you burdens to bear. You say, why is that? Because they don't feel the pain. And you know what? I don't, I don't bear a burden given to me by the brethren. The brethren come up to me with their burdens, and I take them and just toss them in the drink. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I have my own cross to bear. I'm, I'm following the Lord. I'll, I'll bear his cross. You're not putting a cross on me. And you'd be wise as a Christian. Don't let people put their crosses on you. Don't let people put their burdens on you. Don't let people give you guilt trips that you need to do something uh, for them to impress them. Just do right by God. And if that doesn't impress them, nothing will impress them because you'll do far more for them in a good way, doing right by God, than they'd ever do trying to do something they want you to do. So the psalmist said this, the proud, and 
that's what you're dealing with, with lost people. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. And that gets to be really challenging to the people that want to put their burdens on me. Well, there's got to be something wrong with you. You know, that's like, well, it was a simple thing, but I told you, I had a couple, it wasn't just one, I think I had three people when I was required to work full time to support my family in the beginning of the church when they didn't have the resources. And, you know, they come up and, well, you need to quit your job. You're making too much money. You need to quit your job in the good situation that God's given you. You need to go work at Walmart. <clears throat> Basically, like, if you don't do that, well, we can't follow you. You're too proud. It's like, really? <laughs> I don't want to try to impress you. I'll keep my job and take care of my family glorify my Savior. And you can go get a job at Walmart. Now, I don't have a problem with having a job at Walmart. <clears throat> I also had, oh, I had that also, uh, another young kid. Now, this wasn't, but I just showed the mentality of people. I was working for the telephone company. The telephone company went on strike, so I got a job working at the bean plant. And this is, this had nothing to do with God, like that one did, but people don't have good intelligence. I mean, I'm making X number of dollars at the telephone company, and I'm making half of that at the bean plant. And then uh, the bean plant comes through and gives everybody a nickel raise, and at the telephone company, I'm getting a dollar raise when the contract gets signed. And, you know, this kid can't figure out why I wouldn't stay at the, and work with him at the bean plant and go back to the telephone company. And it's like, because I'm going to make a heck of a lot more money, and on top of that, I'm going to get medical benefits that you don't get here, and the only reason I was working here was to make some money while we were out on strike. Now you can get to argue whether I should have been out on strike or not. And I'm not going there tonight. But I'm just showing you mental deficiencies. And not always is making a lot of money uh, a good thing. Yeah, there's reasons, real good reasons, with certain jobs that you should forget the money the job isn't worth it. I mean, you might get $30 an hour to drive a beer truck. I wouldn't get, drive a beer truck. Remember, it was a bean plant that was packaging beans. Beans are legitimate food. I wouldn't, I wouldn't support a booze factory. And some of those booze factories pay real good. Now, there's where you really should pray about taking a cut and pay if you have to to keep your principal and not support such wickedness. This will lead a Christian to be to a perfect heart and whose purpose is to be faithful to the Lord. And that's what it's all about, being faithful to God. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. A perfect heart does not mean a heart without flaws or failure. David had a perfect heart, yet he sinned grievously against the Lord. Also Asa had a perfect heart all his days, yet he failed to remove the high places and instead took treasures out of the house of God to give to the king of Syria. Look at this. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. Now see the perfect heart it's a heart that's totally stayed on God. When David sinned in his transgressions, and they were grievous and heinous, he was guilty of murder and adultery. Both were death sentences under the law. But David never turned from the true God. He said, against thee only have I sinned in the Son. And he went to God and received forgiveness of sin and received the sure mercies of David. He had a pure heart. Now, his heart was not perfect, but God wants us to have a perfect heart with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father, whose heart was perfect. For Solomon went after Asterisk, see, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Micah, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. David had a perfect heart. Solomon, in the end of his reign, an imperfect heart, and Solomon is a picture of type of the Antichrist in the end of his reign. Where in the beginning, he's a perfect type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Solomon stumbles and falls. 
David sins, but he never stumbles and falls. David's heart stays pure and perfect with his God, though he sinned. You see, he only loved the one true God, and he stayed in perfect fellowship with him, except for the carnality of sin and his father's spanking. Now, if there's no chastisement, bang, you bastard. I see some Christians doing some sins, some bad sins, and they get away with it. And there's no chastisement. Maybe it'll come in the process of time. But I'm here to tell you, if you commit heinous sin, the Lord spanked David big time. The Lord will chasten his children. And if you get away with sin, and get away with sin, and get away with sin, and get away with sin, you're going to want to get saved. I can't get away with sin. Boy, when I sin and mess up, I get clobbered. And I don't resent it. I deserve it. And that, that tends to keep me from getting into sin. That's why I won't drink a drink. I'm not going, if I drink a drink, I'd end up getting loaded and, and getting in some big trouble. So I'm not going to drink a drink. I'm not going to get loaded. I'm not going to get in some big trouble. And that probably is going to happen to you. Have a nice day. God bless. The opposite of a perfect heart is a whorish heart. It's a heart that goes after other gods. Both David and Asa had failures in their personal lives and in their leadership, yet they were consistent in removing the idols of their own hearts. Solomon failed in this area and began to worship the idols of his many wives. Therefore, his heart went a whoring after the god of other nations. And that's happening big time in the body of Christ today. The Lord is extremely concerned about the tendency of his people to go after other gods. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord, his God, give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now that's another thing that people people miss in life, is they don't have perspective in life. Yes, David's sin was notorious, heinous, criminal, worthy of death. But it was one moment in time. The rest of David's life was right on with God. And people make a big mistake. One of the great notorious individuals of the Old Testament is Samson. And everybody likes to pick a few spots that the Bible reveals of Samson's downfall and they forget that he judged Israel for so many years and all the rest of the time he was a good judge. Now, I'll give you something in my own personal life. When my wife and I were married for 45 years. Now, I'll just be honest with you. And we probably had 30 real bad days, fights or arguments. People get angry, bitter. And you might have saw one of those. Oh, my God, what a terrible couple. Excuse me. Back up a little bit. 30 times in 43 years less than one argument a year, 363 good days. People don't get it, do they? That's the same thing being a pastor. Pastor a church for um, 35 years and make one little mistake and they want to hand your head to it. Thank you. As my beloved wife used to say, with friends like you, who needs enemies? That was a good saying. A great folly of sin in our days is found in Matthew. Oop. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, 
Now, basically, the pearls represent saved people. And that ye put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the pearl in righteousness and true holiness, that's new converts. The holy is anything that belongs to God. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. We'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that it's wrong or very unwise to take people we win and turn them over to false teachers. And that's what's messed up Christianity. It is also wrong to take anything that belongs to God and to give it to false teachers or prophets. The principle then is to not give that which is the Lord's to the world. And you don't give the church to the world. And that's what's happening today. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. And so a perfect heart is not a treacherous or a trading heart, traitor's heart. And a lot of the brethren today are being treacherous and traitors. And we're encouraged. The Bible teaches us to do good to all men, but gives us a special measure of God's grace to the brethren. Now, I have to deal with brethren with impure and corrupted hearts but I have to have grace for them. As we have therefore opportunity to let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And so there's a lot of monstrous saved Christians out there, and my job is to rebuke them, and my job is to try to instruct them in meekness, considering myself, but my job is also to have grace for them and not be overly judgmental on them, but to forgive them and not partake with them in their sins stay separate from them. Withdraw thyself from every brother that walketh disorderly. That's saved Christians that don't walk right. We know to do good in the reality of our humanity and our needs. This is a scripture verse that is not being taught today. And the devil tricks the church, the body of Christ out of saying, Oh, well, the liberals are teaching that we get to heaven because whenever you talk to lost people, they always think they're going to get to heaven because they're good people. Well, we ought to all be good people. We all ought to, you know, godliness is proper in this life and the life to come, but that isn't what's going to save us. I've already covered that a thousand times. The Bible covers that completely. It's your sins that are going to send you to hell, not your good deeds. And you need a propitiation for your sins because God's holy and he's not going to be an unholy God and say it's okay for you to sin. See, that's like I got asked a question that because people want to do a sin. And well, is this sin? You know, it's not a big sin, but it's a sin they want to get away with. I said, it's absolutely simple. Now, it may not have severe ramifications, but it's still going to be a sin. And you never know when a little sin can have severe ramifications. Because every once in a while, they'll bite you. So my recommendation is don't sin. That's the recommendation of any man of God. You say, well, would you sin in that case? Um, I don't know. I hope not. I hope I'm not stupid. But we all get weak from time to time. And we all get tempted from time to time. And I'm not going to get myself hurt big time. Well, I can give you an illustration. Uh, another subject. Well, what's wrong with premarital sex? Well, if you don't get STDs, if you don't get pregnant, if you don't get your soul broken and destroyed from the relationship, if you don't have any of the consequences that I haven't mentioned, probably nothing. But if you get caught in any one of those, you'll find out why God says he'll judge whoremongers and adulterers. Because they're hurting people. And one virgin girl on one night can end up with a child and a reputation for the rest of her life.
be wise in knowing the will of the Lord. So the Lord tells us, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, now that I'm single, against the will and wishes and, and the good intentions of the brother, I'm praying that God will give me a good godly wife so I don't have to be lonely all my life because it's not good for a man to dwell alone. And the brother got all kinds of ideas of all kinds of things I should do that they think is right for me to do. And some of them will try to mess up my life. And I say, yeah, for friends like you who need them much. Oh, and it's good intentions, but we don't want to see you get hurt. Hey, look, if I marry the wrong lady, I might end up getting hurt. Now, I'm not going to be unwise. But if I don't find somebody to marry, I'm going to be lonely and hurt for the rest of my life. Kind of a catch-22, isn't it? And the Bible says if a man finds a, a good wife, he found favor with the Lord. So maybe if I get on my knees and I pray, maybe God will give me a good wife and I'll find favor with the Lord. And then the brethren will have to have all kinds of contortion. Oh yeah, that's the life of a, of a Bible preacher. It gets deeper than that. As we have therefore opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto those of the household of faith. In the Bible, a perfect heart does not mean a heart without flaws or failures, but a complete or whole heart. When a man has a perfect heart with God, the Lord is the center of his life. The opposite of a perfect heart is a whorish heart. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whether they should be carried captive, because I am broken with a whorish heart, which hath departed from me with their eyes, which go whoring after their idols. And that's what's plaguing the body of Christ today. There's so much idolatry with television and movies and uh, advertising and uh, commerce and uh, wealth and riches that um, there are very few Christians looking at God today. The Bible shows the contrast of a perfect heart with a whorish heart in the lives of King David and his son Solomon. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, Hittites, of the nations concerned which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for they shall surely turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto all these in love. And so he loved the Hollywood crowd, and he loved the jet set crowd. And it, see, that's what you're dealing with. And he loved the uh, free love crowd and the hippie crowd and the hippie crowd. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect. There it is, not perfect, with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Asteros, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Machon, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Our God understands the subtlety of the adversary and is deeply concerned with the tendency of his people to leave the true and living God to go after other gods of wood, stone, metal, and heart. Therefore, he gave his people clear instructions not to make any league with the heathen nations. And what they do? They said, oh, his, his laws are grievous. We got to have socialization, and we need to socialize, and we have dialogue, and we'll get all messed up in sin. But thou shalt worship no other gods, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifices. And thou shalt take of their daughters, thou shalt, uh, and thou shalt take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten God. 
it is obvious all too well, Christians, that the idols of wood, stone, and metal should not be worshipped. Nothing made by man's hands should be worshipped. So by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. But of course, that's that repressive God that keeps you from hurting yourself and hurting other people. You're just such a terrible God that you're a living God. He doesn't want you to hurt other people. He doesn't want you to get hurt. He's just a big, bad God. You just wait there, in knowing, not knowing the scriptures. By mercy and truth. That's the God of the Bible, mercy and truth. The scriptures reveal the true and living God is the God of creation, the eternal spirit. Then Paul stood in the midst of Myers Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. The God that I worship, the God that I serve, is the true eternal spirit, the creator of heaven and earth. No, you did not evolve. You have to be a lunatic to believe that you evolved. I don't have time to get in it right now, but if you really were intelligent and you didn't deny the facts of intelligence, you'd find that life could never have started in the oceans as they try to tell you because of chemistry. You'll find that evolution was impossible because of the understanding of nutrition and everything else that they... Well, the whole evolutionary program comes out of an artist's conception of drawing pictures on easels. That's it, folks. Been there, done that. You know, I am far more intelligent, you don't think so, they'll tell you I'm not, than the evolutionists, because I watch both sides. I was trained and raised to be an evolutionist in an evolutionary high school setting and an evolutionary college setting. I made a distinct choice to throw that hogwash overboard when I learned the facts of science and the coincidence of science. Hey, go get a periodic table. You're a carbon-based creature. Go check out your Antichrist carbon. It's number six on the periodic table. It has six neutrons, six uh, neutrons, and six electrons. Old carbon there. The book was written by God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The creation was brought out of creation by the words of the Spirit of a living, eternal God. Oh, we'd just be done, but I don't have time to get into science and scriptures tonight. I just know more than your PhDs know. Because I've seen both sides. The Lord also commanded the practice of setting up condemn the practice of setting up idols. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. Now, here, a lot of churches. Put me back on so they can see this. See that? That's an idol. You see that thing? That's, that's supposed to be some saint. Now, it looks like a saint with a saint. Because the saints hold the saint over his heart. I guess that's supposed to be a representation of the Lord. But that's a... Um, Aryan uh, face, not a Shemitic face, so it can't be the Lord. And it uh, looks like they got a uh, little moon back here, a little um, halo of some sort. Uh, oh, there's some people with those things. Here. And so people look at that and they'll pray to that. And all that is is a piece of plastic. I can hold it upside down. I can abuse it. Hello. Can I get a pizza to go? 
I mean, let's pray to our saints, you know? Uh, no anchovies. Uh, that's the folly and foolishness of idolatry. Go, laugh out loud. LOL. Have a little fun in your life. Don't be so tight. Chill out. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. Their delectable things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god, or a molten or graven image, that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed. Yeah. Get on the phone. Hello. You're going to be ashamed if this is your communication device to talk to God because there's nobody home. One of the great testimonies to spiritual darkness of the heart is its propensity to worship innate objects. Then came certain elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I be inquired at all by them? No way. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idol in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Ambassadors, should always represent the living, the righteousness of the king they represent through the spirit and grace of life. We'll close with this. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And every one that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and watch. And his commandments are not grievous. In fact, his commandments keep us from grief, from the bitterness, from the roots of bitterness, the grief and the sorrow of the people I run into. If they'd only followed God's commandments, they wouldn't be hurting the way they hurt. Friend, God loves you. Repent of your sins. Trust Christ as your Savior. Repent of your errors. Put your faith and hope in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Be born again and saved and walk in the Spirit.